The Unshackled Waves, episode 144. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the stories we've been focusing on this year at The Unshackled is Victoria's African Youth Gang Crime Wave. As you recall in this show, we had a special episode focusing on the state's summer of crime with associate editor of The Unshackled, Tom Peroni. We also interviewed Hayden Bradford from Protect Victoria and covered their rally outside Parliament House a couple of months ago. One of the suburbs that has been most affected by this crime wave is Tarnit, which is in Melbourne's west. One of the people we met at the Protect Victoria rally was Arnev Sati, who is founder of the community-focused anti-crime group My Tarnit. He was collecting signatures for his own anti-crime position to present to Victoria's government. I believe when there's so much public commentary on the issue, it is important to hear from people who live in suburbs like Tarnit so we can get a first-hand account of the effect the state's crime wave is having on ordinary citizens and what they believe needs to be done to make their suburbs safe again. So I thought Arnev would be able to give us an important insight. Arnev, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Now, I want to get a bit of your background first. Obviously, you've founded My Tarnit and you're a proud uh, resident of the area, but I'd like to know how you came to settle in uh, Tarnit. Okay. Look, I came to Melbourne as an international student in 2001, got my residency, did my bachelor's and became a citizen around 2007. And since that time, I have been living in Melbourne's West. So I've lived all across suburbs like Sunshine, Footscray, Leverton, Point Cook, Williams Landing, and eventually settled up in Tarnit. And so what attracted you to settle in, in that particular area? Oh, look, it's like, you know, there's a saying called once a Westie, always a Westie. You know, so it's like, you know, you actually have got like, you know, you know, lovely families out here, young, young families, you know, people trying to live their normal life. You know, they, the area is good. Like the area actually used to be really good. You know, that actually has changed over the last two, three years, or I'd rather say three, four years. And when did you notice that things were, were changing, that uh, uh, the recreational areas were becoming more uh, dangerous and uh, things such as home invasions and assaults began to happen? All right. Look, what actually happened was, as I said, I've lived in West pretty much throughout the last 18 years. Crime has always been an issue in West, but it used to actually happen out in the streets. You know, as long as you are not using public transport late at night or not walking on streets at odd times, you were safe. But over the last few years, pretty much last three to four years, crime actually has come from the street to our homes. And that's where I actually noticed the change. You talk about home invasions, burglaries, assaults, carjacking, all of these things have massively increased over the last few years. And then pretty much impacts everyone living in Tarnate or you know, everyone living in, in Melbourne, put it this way. Like at night time, if there's actually a noise, you don't say that it's, a, it's your neighbor's cat or neighbor's dog. You actually fear that someone actually has come to your house. Yeah, I'd imagine that would be uh, pretty fearful. Now, as the, these gradually started to increase because... Uh, most of the, the nation heard about what was happening in Melbourne's West over uh, the, the last summer, but obviously it was a gradual uh, process. Well, when did you start to give uh, authorities, the, the police, community leaders and politicians feedback that, hey, this is you know, getting worse, it's, it's not just uh, a perception, There's, uh, they're actually occurring more often? All right, look, what actually happened was you know, if I typically talk about Ecoville, Ecoville was actually a troubled area for at least 18 months, last 18 months. And it's only after it got reported into the media that the activities down there slowed down a bit. So it was basically for 18 months, you know, there was nothing, you know, like, you know, the, the, area, the area was like really impacted by these thugs, if I can use that word, you know, so 
And the main thing is the response from police community leaders and politicians has been very weak and minimal. It's like, you know, both like until recently, both Victoria police and state government, they were actually in a state of denial and they literally refused to accept that there's actually a crime, you know, there's actually a gang crime in existence. And then we actually had some statement coming from Victoria police saying, yes, the gang violence exists, but you know, state government is still in, den in denial. You know, so that's actually that part. And the funny part is, if you, if you see state government and Victoria police both in denial, but suddenly in you know December last year or early January this year, they created a community task force. You know, the task force actually had particular you know members of particular background in in it. So basically, at one hand, you say there is no crime, or you say the crime is getting in decreased. And on the other hand, you create a community task force to deal with the crime. I simply don't understand this. And if you would have seen recently, you know, there's actually this community state safety statement, which actually has been, you know, which is basically jointly issued by state government and Victoria Police Commissioner. So suddenly, seven months before the elections this year, which are in November this year, you know, the government and the police, suddenly the focus actually has come on to community safety. Like we have had an ex escalated crime situation in Victoria over the last four or five years, you know, and nothing was pretty much done. And suddenly now, you know, community safety is actually a concern. And look, you know, I actually had a good read about the community safety statement recently. And one thing it still misses out is actually youth crime, youth gangs, and young repeat offenders. And the problem which I've got as a resident of Tarnet, and especially being of Indian origin, I really don't know whom to go to. Whom should I call as a community leader? A leader who is of Indian origin, should that be my leader? Or a leader who belongs to the area of Tarnet and is actively involved in solving this issue out? You know, I, I actually can't find either. And, you know, and that actually was my main reason why I actually started my petition. So it was actually my sheer frustration of not being able to do anything, living in fear, seeing my friends and my known people, you know, getting assaulted at times, you know, hearing about all these burglaries, assaults, you know, carjackings happening in Tarnate or surrounding suburbs throughout. And all of this actually led me to create a petition at change.org. And, you know, and pretty much the petition actually has got 18,000 signatures now. But unfortunately, it doesn't have any validity in state parliament because it's actually at change.org. So now I actually have got a, another paper based petition, which is currently being signed by the people. One other thing that actually has happened is a month back, I got a letter from our Premier Daniel Andrews, you know, because when I actually was putting up this petition, I did write him a letter saying, look, the year, you know, the situation in Tarnet is really bad. You cannot compare Tarnet with the rest of Victoria. You know, averaging out crimes will not solve the issues at Tarnet, you know, and the reply which I got from him was like a cut copy paste from any official statement. You know, that's something which we have been consistently hearing from government over the last three years. But the reality is they are real people, real lives, real victims, real trauma. And it stays, it could stay with you for a month. It could stay for you for a year. Who knows? So look, all of this thing has, you know, has actually made the situation in Tarnet a lot more worse than what it was four or five years back. Probably the politics of the area uh, doesn't help your cause, given that uh, Tarnit is a safe uh, Labor area, and uh, obviously they they believe they're going to be easily re-elected at the next election and solving an issue such as uh, increased crime. It costs uh, money and uh, resources, and it's quite hard to do. And so they're they're very reluctant to admit that uh, there's a problem that we need to tackle. Yes, that is actually. You know, one of the, you know, what I'll say is the biggest disadvantage of Tarnate as an electorate is it's actually a safe labor seat. What that implies is people are taken for granted. It's more like a colonial rule, you know, of labor in Tarnate. That's exactly what, you know, what, what, what it is. You know, like 
at at my turn 8, you know, the Facebook page which I've got, I do petitions, you know, not petitions, I actually do polls a lot of times. And I did a poll about, you know, is there a need in Tarnet for a police station? Like the police station in Tarnet, which we have got at Wyndham North, is actually a part-time police station. Like imagine a suburb being, you know, publicized or covered in media across three months last year, like last December to February this year, for those three months and still, the police station in that area is actually a part, I'll rather call it a part-time police station, right? So you actually plan or the government or the local MPs out here, you know, plan to solve the problem of crime with with a part-time police station, right? So this might, so the safe seat of Tarnet is not actually helping anything, like people are just being taken for granted and look, one other unfortunate thing which we had is we had our you know member of parliament being caught up in an expense scandal pretty much 18 months or two years back and since then pretty much you know we don't actually have an mp you know the mp is there but he's as good as not being there you know so you know when you cater all of these things into into situation you know, the the problem at Tarnet, you know, until some strong measures are taken, you know, the problem, the escalating crime in Tarnet is not going to actually settle down. Now, I'd like to add one more thing. What's actually happening is, you know, when you talk about Tarnet, usually what happens is council actually has got a bit more better stats. So what happens is they say in Wyndham, which covers Tarnate, Point Cook, you know, other area, areas of where he says the crime is actually going down. And someone actually, you know, they actually do publish these things at neighborhood watches or, you know, other government places or forums. The decrease in crime as per the last incident till end of last year in Tarnate was one less incident. So basically the number of incidents that happened in Tarnet in 2016 to the number of incidents that happened in Tarnet in 2017, the difference was only one incident. So, you know, they say, you know, the Victorian crime is going down or the rate is going down. Well, take out the stats for Tarnet, right? One incident less, you know, I, I, like if, if there's one incident, like it's, a, it's as good as nothing's actually happening to the area. And, and as you actually mentioned, the safe labor seat is actually a big problem for Tarnit. You know, there's actually, the, the problem is, you know, this, you know, the, the problem is the intent to do something is just not there. And that is actually the problem. Like this time, you know, uh, I, sh I like, you know, I, I shouldn't actually tell that, but I'll, but I'll be explicit that this time, you know, the labor candidate for Tarnit is actually a person who is not even, who actually until recently was not even from Victoria, right? And now that person is actually settled, I think, near Alton or somewhere. So we again, we actually have got a probable candidate from Labour because it's a safe site parachuted to this area. And, you know, and like, if that person doesn't understand the dynamics of Tarnit as such, you know how the hell how the hell in the world you're gonna solve this problem? And it is a real problem. You know, go on, go out on the streets, talk to people. You know, as I said, the voice at night makes you feel there's someone at your place, rather than saying it's a neighbor's cat or it, it's a, you know it's just a random voice. That doesn't happen in, anymore. If you wake up at night at three o'clock due to a noise, the first thing that comes to your mind is basically, you know. It's actually, is someone trying to come to my house, invade my property, invade my privacy, breaking into my house? Is my gu is my garage, you know, not broken into? These incidents are not random incidents anymore. They happen on a regular basis in Tarnate. Yeah, a reduction of one crime per year. I mean, it would be, you know, a politician would have a nerve to spin that to say pr uh, crime's going down. And the fact that you don't even have a 24-hour police station i mean that's just madness considering you know what uh, what's going on there now uh, a lot of the the media talk over the summer has been on the 
the African race of the, the criminals has been referred to as Victoria's African uh, youth gang uh, crime wave. And the uh, Tarnit area, it has had an influx of uh, African migration. Is the, the African uh, element of playing a big part in, in, in the crime wave, as the media is reporting? All right, look, this is my purely my thoughts, right? So, because I myself is a part of this migration. As I, as I said, I came to Australia, you know, did my studies, did my residency, became here. Any sort of migration is actually good as long as people contribute to the area. I, I don't really think, you know, the African migration to the area is actually the actual problem. I actually have got friends with people, you know, I mean, I've, I've got friends who are actually from, you know, African origin in my area. I've got work colleagues who are from African origin trying to make a decent living, you know, contributing actively to the society. The problem is not whether someone is from an African origin or not. The problem lies that you actually have got these youth offenders or repeat offenders who have taken the system for granted, who know for sure that if they do something today, they might be, yeah, they might get caught by police tomorrow. The next day they may be at court, you know, and then they would be, you know, they would get bailed out. And next week you would actually have the same lot committing a similar offense. So the real problem is actually there is no serious consequence for the crime. You know, this slap on the wrist or soft on crime policy is just not working right now. You know, these offenders are not afraid of committing the same crime again and again and again because they, there are literally no consequences of these crimes. And on the other hand, you actually have got innocent people getting victimized each and every day. Irrespective whether it's an adult or a child, as I said, it can take months and years to get out of that trauma. And, you know, if you put yourself in the place of a victim, the very first thing you do is you feel sad. You feel very, very sad. I do agree with the fact that, you know, this particular community is overrepresented in crime stats, but that does not mean you know, the whole entire community is bad. But what it means is it needs focus. But at the same time, you need to have the same consequences for committing a crime for everyone. You know, the law needs to be the same. Yeah, I you know, you can't exactly actually... Right there. You know, uh, I mean, we could solve this uh, pro uh, problem irrespective of, you know, which you know, race is committing it by just applying the law equally, that teaching uh, whoever, wherever they come from, that breaking the law has serious consequences. And that's how... You know, most people learn. They learn not to do something if, you know, there's consequences. Correct. And look, you know, and, and look, and, and that, is, that is basically the fundamentals of law and order in every place in the world. You know, someone does something and if, if that thing is treated as a crime, it's a serious crime, they get sentenced for it. In Victoria, it's just the way around. You know, as long as you're young, you know, you know, you, you know, you can actually go commit a crime, you could be bailed, you know, very soon. And the next day, you know, you would be committing the same crime again and again. So at the end of the day, like, how many cases have we got of these repeat bail of, you know, repeat offenders on bail, recommitting a crime, like go to any website, if you just search on Google repeat offenders, you know, crime, you would actually have n number of instances, you know, where a repeat offender, comes out, you know, like gets get caught, you know, it takes a good effort from the police to catch a criminal, that's first. When these thugs are actually get caught, you know, they go to the court, they get bailed out, and the next week they're doing the same thing. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a loop which is not going to end till the time there are serious consequences for committing a crime irrespective in Victoria, like it doesn't matter whether you're in Tarnade or you're actually on the other side in Frankston or in Kerem Downs, it really doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you do something, if it's criminal in nature, you should actually have a consequence for it. That consequence becomes the deterrent for someone to not do it again. And that deterrent is simply missing.
Now, some of the media has uh, accused you know, those people who are you know, looking at ways to you know, solve this uh, crime wave. Uh, a lot of the media said, oh, it's uh, made up, but uh, you know, if you're concerned about it, you must be some sort of uh, white supremacist. Now, obviously, you're of uh, Indian origin. And it's interesting, a lot of the, the news I've watched about uh, crime uh, being committed, uh, a lot of the victims are... Um, Indian. So yeah, it's certainly to be, you know, a victim of crime. You can be any race, and uh, you know, you deserve to, you know, make sure that you're safe from the uh, safe from these perpetrators. Look, that is actually correct. But I think you know, the if if you go one step back, uh, this is again my belief. You know. In Australia, we re actually have two main ideologies in the society. You've got a right wing and you've got a right and left wing. You know, frankly speaking, I believe these both of these ideologies are actually outdated and they need to be updated based on the current needs of the society. And I think that's why the people are also divided between these ide ideologies. Some supports the left, some supports the right. As I said, you know, I was actually here, I came here as part of migration. I have pretty much traveled a lot of places in Australia, and I firmly believe Melbourne people are more friendlier and easygoing than any other, you know, than any other people living elsewhere in Australia. And if these same people today are concerned about their safety, I won't actually call them racist. These are common people living common lives fearing about their safety and asking the government or police or people in power for solutions. So you look it up, if asking for one's safety is being racist, you, I think your definition is wrong then. Yeah, uh, that, that's a pretty good uh, message, I think. And also uh, some of the media as well, they've tried to like, for example, mock uh, Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton when he said that people are scared to uh, go, out, go out at a restaurant at night and then these people tweet photos of themselves uh, at a dinner saying, oh, look, I feel completely safe. And there was even a, a, a judge who uh, did that. I mean, uh, does that frustrate you a lot? Look, I think there's actually two different things. Yes, it does frustrate me you know, a lot. The reason is I haven't seen any politician or a judge taking a selfie with a victim. Have you seen one? I haven't yeah, seen that's one. That's a good point. Right? I haven't seen a, lo a lawyer fighting for the other person taking a selfie with the victim, you know? Now, so the, so, the, so, so, so the thing is, till the time it doesn't happen to you, you won't feel the impact. That is actually a reality. Like, no matter what happens, Till the time your family comes in danger, you will not really feel the real impact what this thing actually has got. Like fear of safety is like, you know, put it this way. I work nine to five, you know, I come home towards my family, have supper. All I need is a good night's sleep. If anyone invades my privacy at that time, or if I fear for my safety, during the time I get down at Tarnit station, walk to the car park, take a car, come to my place, sleep at my place, and then go to work next day. All the time, if, you know, if you can't be safe, you know, if you don't actually have that surety that you are safe, you know, it's a big stress added on to your life. Now, if you see about people mocking concerns, look, personally, I haven't seen many people mocking my concerns till date. There are few people online who like to comment, but at the end of the day, you cannot keep everyone happy, right? And more than keeping everyone happy, it's like, has it actually happened to yourself? Has it actually happened to any of your family, friends, work colleague? That's the time when you really, you know, when you really feel the seriousness of an issue. If, you know, and, 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 and again, this is my perspective. If anyone, you know, one day comes to me and mocks about my concerns, which I've got, Mind you, internet, I have not got anyone come face to face to me and mock my concern till late. You know, people, like I would say over 95% of the people, because if you go to the polls which I've got in my internet, 95% of the people pretty much, or 90% of people most of the time actually agree with the polls which I put in through. 
And a lot of those polls are actually crime-based polls. They're actually anti-crime polls. So, you know, if someone actually mocks a concern, I would rather actually, you know, have a coffee with that person and ask him what are his point of views because maybe he's missing something. You know, if, if it hasn't happened at your home or to the people you love or to the people you care about, that doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't exist. So, you know, crime is a reality in Tarnit. Increasing in crime is a more reality in crime, you know, a, a more reality. Plus, you know, you do also have people who actually have given up on the system. You know, so, you know, put it this way, in police records, it only gets, you know, recorded if someone makes a call and it gets attended. There are people who actually have given up on these things and for minor for minor assaults, I won't say assaults, but for minor crimes, they, they don't even worry about reporting it to the police. You know, I actually had one real life incident where one of my friends actually went out to watch a movie. He came late night. He found his house was broken into. He called the cops. Cops said, don't go into the property we are coming from 12 at night till 3 in the morning he waited for the cops he called them a couple of times only to be told by the cops at four o'clock in the morning look we are busy we will only come to you tomorrow and the question he asked the cops is just let me know what the hell i'm supposed to do and then the cops said look cops said look it up just see if there's no one in there just get into the house so from that, like, imagine your house being broken into, you know, and you have no real-time access to police. Your front door is of no use. You actually have got a family, you've got a wife, you've got two young kids. You know, pretty much most of the population in Tarnit is young families, right? Imagine the trauma that person actually have suffered in those eight on you know at least those eight hours it's really really frightening and it actually has happened to one of my really close mates you know so and the situation hasn't improved you know it, it like that is actually a reality it hasn't improved yeah i think if that you're uh not a victim of crime you should be thankful i'm i mean i live in a relatively safe area of uh, melbourne and you know i'm grateful for it i certainly wouldn't wouldn't say that oh because it hasn't happened to me that it's it's not happening in uh other places and yeah the, the those uh that story that you just told me i get uh, it shows uh, when you know, crime increases, the the police their their resources get drained. They're only going to come if uh, someone's at at physical risk. If they they probably think if it's a, a break in that oh you know no one's going to be harmed by that. Oh, we'll just uh, leave that. True, but look, let's go one step back. The reason for this is because the way I actually have read, I mean, you know did my research after my petition and things on those lines. We don't have that many first responders or frontline police officers in Tarnit, right? So if you know if it's a known fact that you don't have that many first responders, you know, you know the irony is you know what the problem is, but the intent is not there. And then if you actually have to do something, you will average it out. Like so, you will average it out out across Wyndham. And if the stats are still not that pretty, you will average it out the whole of Melbourne. You know, and 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 as I said, crime is actually escalating. You know, it's it used to be in very few suburbs, you know, two years back, three years back. Now it's random in nature. It happens anywhere and everywhere in Melbourne. It's just, you know, you know, you usually use the word being grateful, it hasn't happened to you. I think the word is lucky. You know, you are really lucky if that hasn't happened to you. And if, if it has happened to you, you're just unlucky. You know, at the, you know, at the end of the day, are we just the stats? Like, you know, a normal person who is getting victimized is not a stats. You know, he's a person with a family working, you know, have, you know, if especially a lot of people that are migrants, you know, they have worked their way over the last five years, 10 years, built up a house, 
got up a nice car, you know, kids raised up a family. You know, all of this, you know, cannot actually be just left like that. You know, it's a risk to a castle which someone actually has made in their own world. And that's exactly what it is. Now, creating a community organization such as Martinet, it's it's very uh, difficult. You've got to, it takes a lot of your time. You've got to reach out to uh, quite a, a large uh, group of people. What uh, reception has the the organization received? Have you been able to get you know people uh, telling their stories, uh, engaging in uh, campaigns to uh, lobby uh, politicians and members of the council? Okay. All right, look, put it this way, in terms of participation, you know, because, you know, remember there's a fear factor in Tarnit. You know, you cannot actually overrule the fear factor in Tarnit. So as long as it comes around giving up a vote, you know, like participating in polls and voting in polls, you know, people have been really proactive and active and reactive in the issues that are raised in my Tarnit. You know, so, you know, it is actually evident, like, you know, as I said, a lot of these families are actually young family, you know, families with young kids. You know, the last thing you want actually is to be in a situation where you are more prone to getting attacked. So as long as active participation, online participation is concerned, yes, people are really, really active. In terms of, you know, making up it a community movement, I haven't reached that stage as yet. I do have a true intent of reaching that state at one point in time. But right now, it's, you know, there's a word called online warriors. You know, so a lot of the people are actually online warriors. And there's nothing wrong in being an online warriors, right? At least you're doing something rather than not doing nothing. You know, and especially when we actually have, I could say, especially when we have got state government not doing much for a lot of years, Victoria Police unable to do much for a lot of years, as compared to these two parties, these online warriors or fellow people in Tarnet, they are doing a lot more better. At least there is an awareness that they are actually accepting the facts and they actually agree with the facts. And the only reason you agree with the fact is because you can relate to a fact. So if, you know, you know, I would say, look, you know, go, go through polls at my target, you know, and you would see a majority of the people have the same voice. And that is the main purpose of my target, organizing the community voice into one single voice. Based on my target, I actually have written to, you know, Premier, Wyndham Council, you know, and a lot of people. And... I, you know, and I do share these things at my target and I always get a positive response. As I said, there would always be few people, you know, who always get the story wrong, but it's not about appeasing someone. It's not keeping everyone happy. It's about my safety and I'm dead serious about it. Yeah, well, uh, you're describing the, the fear factor there, the fact that there would actually be, you know, re repercussions. These gangs would actually notice that, oh, you've spoken out against us, so we're going to target you. I mean, that's very chilling. Oh, uh, look, there was a story published very recently online. Internet, a teen walked across a person and actually said on that person's face, you know, I can actually hit you right now and I won't be jailed. Right? Oh. That's the... That's the audacity of someone walking across, walking across someone's house, looking the person face to face and saying, hey, if I hit you today, you know I won't be jailed. It's basically you who are going to lose something. Right. This is unacceptable. This is just unacceptable. Like, are you trying to make Tarnate a third world country or a third world area? Like... And look, you know, as you actually mentioned this fact about a safe labor seat, well, you know, Tarnit's been, based on my knowledge, Tarnit's been a labor seat since 2002, right? So in last 16 years, right, this is the crime or this is a law and order which a safe seat has given Tarnit, that someone can walk to your door, 
you know, and say on your face, hey, you know, don't mess up with me because I can beat you or I can actually smack you or I could be violent to you, but I won't be getting jailed. Like, this is just unacceptable, as I said before. This is bad, just bad. Yeah, you would think that if a, a politician, uh, a community leader hears, hears something like that, I mean, yeah, it sounds completely terrifying. That, and, you know, you, you, you're trapped, basically. You, you know, you want to do something about it. You want to feel safe. But it's, uh, you're, you're in this uh, catch-22 that if you speak up, it could get worse. But if you don't, then you're just uh, sitting duck. Yes, it is. Look, the very fact is you're actually sitting duck. There's no two ways about it. Any person residing in Tarnet is a sitting duck as of today. It can improve in six months, it can take next six years, or it might not improve ever at all in, in, a, in, its, own life, in its own time period. But right now, any person who feels at night that he is not safe is actually a sitting duck. You know, there's no two ways about it. Then, in terms of, as I said, you know, in terms of, you know, the politicians, you know, or leaders, I don't think we have ever had an MP who actually have ever lived in Tarnate. You know, there's no, there hasn't been a single member in a long time in the history of Tarnate electorate, a member who actually used to live in Tarnate. You know, so if a member of parliament is not actually living in Tarnate or nearby, how the hell on earth he going to know the real issues? And that's why these situations actually escalate, escalate and escalate. Like all of this is actually would have been solved four years back or six years back or three years back, whatever the time is, when someone would have seen there's an upward trend for something, you know, but you need to actually have an intent for it. Now, there's one other thing which I'll touch up on this thing. It's actually the council. The Wyndham Council has got its advocacy strategy online. You know, you're more than welcome to go to that advocacy strategy. It will talk on everything and it's got some good points. It talks about Wyndham as such because Wyndham actually is getting around 900 to 1,000 people moving every month to Wyndham. It's like 12,000 people a year, right? But that advocacy strategy really fails on talking much in terms of crime. So, you know, so even at council level, the advocacy for you know, against crime is actually not there. You know, so you actually have got a council who is, look, at the end of the day, I do agree that law and order is actually a state issue. It is not a council issue. But still, when they, you know, when they can advocate on a lot of issues, which is actually related to state government, they can also advocate strongly on crime, you know. Basic problems in the area, lack of police, a police station, you know, not being full time. You don't see cops patrolling the area. Uh, you know, that's the basic with the, you know, with the area. Then you actually have got these police stations which are overcrowded. Like when I say overcrowded is there are times, you know, when people actually have said their triple zero calls were not actually even responded. And the fact is, these stats do not get published anywhere publicly. So Victoria Police will not report on calls which were not responded or on triple zero calls that were not responded. So the real stats are actually unknown. So what I'm trying to get at is the situation is a lot more worse than it seems like. Uh, what do you make of uh, these, you know, community-based solutions? Uh, there was the, there was a big show with these, uh, you know, Sudanese uh, police officers mm -hmm. that people proposed that if we invest more money in uh, youth services, mm -hmm. uh, education, yep. uh, that that will help uh, solve the the problem. What do you make of those? See, the thing is, it may help to an extent, but the real problem is there is no consequence for a crime. No one actually holds our judiciary accountable for giving bails to an offender involved in a repeat crime. You know, no one actually holds our, holds our judiciary responsible at all or accountable at all. 
you know that's one part so basically you actually have got a deadly mix of lack in police numbers you know literally negligible or minimal intent from the local government to actually solve these crime issues and you actually have got judiciary you know who is actually really good on giving community orders rather than stronger sentences which you know which actually acts as a strong deterrent for a criminal or for an offender not to re-offend again so at the end of the day this could be a step but it is not the step you know it's not it is actually not a situation where one particular sol solution can actually solve this whole thing it, there needs to be a collaboration between Victoria Police, local community, neighborhood watch, judiciary, state government, because it's actually, look, I would rather call it as a crisis, right? It's actually a crime crisis. And it can only be solved if all of these parties become active to it. And rather being reactive, we become proactive in our approaches. Like, as I said about this community safety statement released, you know, it talks a lot of things which my petition actually covers. It talks about, you know, stronger bail laws, stronger sentences, you know, increasing police, things on those lines. But the thing is, no one gives a timeline. Like, what we really need is, we don't need a five-year plan here because things will get even worse. Things have gone from bad to worse in last three years itself. We do not have the liberty of next five years or next four years to improve the area. We need to do something now. And it is a state election year due uh, in last Saturday in November. Uh, are yes. you, uh, this is obviously probably the time when you can be most effective when mm -hmm. with lobbying uh, politicians. You mentioned your uh, petition. Is there, there any other type of activism you've got planned between now and November? Look, right now I'm going to every door. Put it this way, right now I'm going to all the doors which are present. I'm writing to everyone I should be writing to. Even on my online polls I'm actually tagging everyone up. But eventually you know, there needs to someone who needs to stand for Tarnate. You know, a parachuting candidate on a safe labor seat not going to help. You know, as long as this seat becomes marginal, this area will see a lot of change. Right? Who who actually does it is not important. You know, it's not important who who actually does it, whether it's a person I know, whether it's a person you know, it's an existing political candidate, I really don't care. You know, all we need is someone who has got the intent to do something for the area. And as you said, because it's a election year, it would be really interesting to say what comes after because this community state safety statement, as you said, has actually have you know is actually out. Between now and November you know, these assaults or these crimes not going to stop. So it would be interesting to see, do these things really get implemented between now and November? Or is it again, you know, a gimmick? I would, I would actually call it an election gimmick. Based on the responses which I have received or seen from the state government till date, what I've read on, online about the Victoria Police and other things in Tarnet and in Melbourne across, I believe it's an election gimmick and I'm happy to be corrected in seven months time. But till then, this thing, the area gets improved, you know, the policing gets improved, the crime gets reduced, I would treat it as an election gimmick, nothing more than that. I've appreciated you uh, sharing your st story on uh, today's show, Anev. We wish you uh, all the best uh, with uh, my Tarnit and hope that you can bring some lasting change to your area and it, it can once again be a safe place where people can raise their, their families in, in, in safety. Oh, look, you know, my Tarnit going to stay, right? This year, next year, you know, it's a good platform which I actually have, you know, which I started with. Now we actually have got a few more moderators onto the page, but it's a very good platform 
for people in Tane to raise their voices and it could be anything. Right now it is actually crime. You know, tomorrow it could be any other thing which is actually which anything which needs to be taken care in Tarnet, my Tarnet, I think should it will actually serve as a good platform. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Our friends at Liberty Works have got two exciting upcoming events. The first is the Sydney launch of Menace Days, the untold story of Menace Island, which you remember we interviewed the author Michael Coates on episode 140. It is being launched by Miranda Devine on April 26th at 6 p.m. at the Metropolitan Hotel. Then there is also the A Jew, Muslim and Christian Walk Into a Bar featured uh, Abi Yemeni, Imam Tawidi and Kira Lee Smith with Professor James Allen as the Devil's Advocate. That is on Thursday the 17th of May at the Mount Grubbin Bowls Club in Brisbane. Uh, Sydney and Melbourne events will be announced shortly. Tickets can be purchased at libertyworks.org.au. Also, don't forget if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Also, don't forget we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.